On December 9, 1947, Truman approved issuance of NSC-4, entitled Coordination of Foreign Intelligence Information Measures, at the urging of Secretaries Marshall, Barstall, Patterson, and the Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff, Kennan, who, by the way, were all members of the Council on Foreign Relations. The Foreign and Military Intelligence Book One Final Report of the Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with Respect to Intelligence Activities, United States Senate, 94th Congress, Second Session, Report Number 94-755, April 26, 1976, page 49, states. This directive empowered the Secretary of State to coordinate overseas information activities designed to counter communism. A top secret annex to NSC-4, which was NSC-4 Alpha, or 4A, for those of you who are confused by military terms, instructed the Director of Central Intelligence to undertake covert psychological activities in pursuit of the aims set forth in NSC-4 and secretly was to run a psychological operation against the American public to hide the presence of UFOs and aliens. The initial authority given the CIA for covert operations under NSC-4A did not establish formal procedures for either coordinating or approving these operations. How many of you understand what I just said to you? Not too many. Let me explain it. What this means, the initial authority given the CIA for covert operations under, under NSC-4 Alpha did not establish formal procedures for either coordinating or approving these operations. That means they had to answer to no one. It means go do what you got to do. Don't bring any dirt back here, because we don't want to see it. Just get the job done. Don't ask anybody. Don't report to anybody. That's exactly what it means. It simply directed the DCI, which is the Director of Central Intelligence, to undertake covert actions and to ensure, through liaison with state and defense, that the resulting operations were consistent with American policy. The only guideline was that it was consistent with American policy. Later, NSC 10-1 and NSC 10-2 were to supersede NSC 4 and NSC 4A, and NSC 10-1 was to establish the Office of Policy Coordination, or the OPC, was chartered to carry out an expanded program of covert activities. It was directly responsible for the alien task projects, and it was the direct forerunner of MJ-12. NSC 10-1 and 10-2 validated illegal and extralegal practices and procedures as being agreeable to the national security leadership. The reaction, of course, was very swift. In the eyes of the intelligence community, no holes were barred. Under NSC 10-1, an executive coordination group was established to review, but not approve, covert project proposals. Why? Because if you've ever read or known anything about President Truman, he was a mean little guy. And he didn't believe in trusting everybody else to do the right thing. And he kept the power solidly in his hands. He did not give it to anyone. The ECG was secretly tasked to coordinate the alien projects. NSC 10 slash 1 and 2 were interpreted to mean that no one at the top wanted to know about anything until it was over and successful. These actions established a buffer between the president and the information, and it's important that you understand this because it's important later. It was intended that this buffer serve as a means for the president to deny knowledge if leaks divulge the true state of affairs. That is to prevent the collapse of the government. If the president can stand up and say, I didn't know about it, the government can survive. If the president cannot say that, then you have a very, very dangerous situation indeed. The buffer was used in later years for the purpose of effectively isolating succeeding presidents from any knowledge of the alien presence other than what the secret government and the intelligence community wanted them to know. 
NSC 10-2 established a study panel which met secretly and was made up of the scientific minds of the day and may very well have included some of those names which are on the fraudulent document known as Majestic 12 or the Eisenhower briefing document which is in reality a contingency plan to lead you right through the Rose Garden. The study panel was not called MJ-12. In fact, the study panel was never called MJ-12. Another NSC memo, NSC 10-5, further outlined the duties of the study panel. These NSC memos and secret executive orders set the stage for the creation of MJ-12 only four years later. Now it gets nasty. Secretary of Defense James Forrestal began to object to the secrecy. He was a very idealistic and religious man who believed that the public should be told. When he began to talk to leaders of the opposition party and leaders of the Congress about the alien problem, he was asked, which is a polite way of saying you're fired, to resign by Truman. He expressed his fears to many people and rightfully believed that he was being watched and that his life was threatened. This was interpreted by those who were ignorant of the facts as paranoia because most people had no knowledge of what was really going on. Forrestal later was said to have suffered a mental breakdown and was admitted, they say, actually he was committed to Bethesda Naval Hospital against his will. In fact, it was feared that Forrestal would begin to talk again and he had to be isolated, discredited, and shut up. Sometime in the early morning of May 22, 1949, agents of the CIA tied a sheet around his neck, fastened the other end to a fixture in his room, and threw James Forrestal out the window. The sheet tore, and he plummeted to his death, and he became one of the first victims of the cover-up. The live alien that had been taken from the 1949 Roswell crash was called EB. It was short for extraterrestrial biological entity, and all aliens are not called Evie. Evie had a tendency to lie and for over a year would give only the desired answers to questions asked. Those questions which would have resulted in an undesirable answer went unanswered. At some point during the second year of captivity, he began to open up and the information derived from Evie was startling to say the least. And this compilation of his revelations became the foundation of what would later be finished, called the Yellow Book. Photographs were taken of Evie, which among others, I and Bill English were to view years later in Grudge 13. Why do they keep the aliens in a Faraday-shielded environment? Because they have a tendency to disappear right through walls. And if you can prevent the transmission of electromagnetic energy, you can stop them from doing it. In late 1951, Evie became ill. Medical personnel had been unable to determine the cause of Evie's illness and had no background from which to draw. Evie's system was chlorophyll-based and he processed food into energy much the same as plants. Waste material was excreted almost exactly the same as plants. It was decided that an expert in botany was called for. A botanist, Dr. Guillermo Mendoza, was brought in to try and help him recover. Those of you who have been looking for him on medical lists will not find him there. He was a PhD in botany. 